This is the uh, 2020 uh, mock AP exam number four. Uh, we have a table of values uh, where we're given uh, values at certain uh, uh, for certain intervals here for G prime as well as for G double prime. All right, so part A says, what can we conclude using mean value theorem in the interval from one to 10? Well, we know that G prime is uh, twice differentiable. So we know that a function has to be uh, differentiable and continuous uh, in order uh, for mean value theorem to be applied. So uh, let's review mean value theorem. Mean value theorem says that I can, um, as long as it's a smooth curve, I can find the slope between the endpoints and that slope is going to be guaranteed to sit somewhere between those endpoints um, as a tangent line. So since G prime is differentiable, which also means that it's continuous, then by mean value theorem, we can adapt this uh, mean value theorem uh, form uh, to uh, adapt to, uh, to now be uh, G double prime. So we can find the slope between endpoints of the G prime graph and know that, um, uh, that the slope is going to be shared by the second derivative at a point. So we know our endpoints are 1 and 10. So we can say g prime of 10 minus g prime of 1 is equal to uh, over 10 minus 1. That's going to be, look at our table of values, that's going to be um, 0 minus 9. So that's going to give us negative 9 over positive 9, which is negative 1. So we can guarantee that g double prime is going to have to be equal to negative 1 somewhere on the graph between 1 and 10 because this is the slope that we found between the endpoints and we know that it's a smooth curve. So uh, uh, our, our uh, second derivative value of negative one is guaranteed. Okay, number two, uh, part B rather, uh, use left Riemann sum with three subintervals indicated in the table to approximate the depth integral of G prime from one to 10. Is this an over or under approximation of the actual depth integral? Okay. So Riemann sums uh, means we're going to be uh, adding areas of rectangles. So we have three subintervals here from 1 to 10. This is one subinterval, second subinterval, third subinterval. Each subinterval, we can subtract the x's to find the width. So 3 minus 1, first subinterval has a width of 2, 4 minus 3, second interval has, has a um, width of 1, third interval, 10 minus 4, that's a width of 6. And then we just have to find the height that corresponds to the width to get to the area of these rectangles. So we want left Riemann sum, so we want to choose the left height from the G prime um, uh, from the uh, from the G prime list of values. So width is two, height is nine, two times nine. For the second subinterval, width is one, height is seven, one times seven. Third subinterval, width is six, height is five, six times five. So we add the three areas together, and we get 18 plus 7 plus 30, which is 55. All right. Uh, now we know that this graph is going to be decreasing. So because it's decreasing and uh, we're uh, creating left Riemann sums, we know that these approximations will actually be an over approximation. You can tell that the area of these three rectangles is going to be more than the actual area of the graph between uh, the curve and the x-axis. So because of that, uh, we know that Riemann sum, our approximation will be an over approximation of the actual area. All right, part C, uh, evaluate the definite integral uh, of g double prime of one minus three x. This is not something we can plug in the calculator. We're gonna have to work this through using u substitution. So we'll uh, let our u value be uh, one minus three x. Uh, find the derivative, du over dx is negative 3, dx equals du over negative 3. So we make our substitution with the parentheses and with the dx. So we get g double prime of u of du over negative 3. We can push that negative 3 out in front as negative 1 third. And now uh, we're going to work towards uh, the fact that we have something that we can use to evaluate g double prime of u. Okay. Using first theorem of calculus, we know g double prime of u, the antiderivative will just produce one level up to g prime, and we can plug in our upper and lower bounds. So if we pull that negative one-third out, everything has been, has been converted to be in terms of u, 
And that's something we've got to be aware of because these uh, original bounds are not yet in terms of u. These are in terms of x. So this is where we want to be with our antiderivative uh, 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 when we apply anti our antiderivative step. But our bounds have to be in place as well. So we have to push these uh, bounds through our conversion so we can get them in terms of u. So we'll plug negative 1 in for x. So 1 minus 3x, 1 minus 3 times negative 1, that's 1 plus 3, which is 4. So our new upper bound, sorry, our new lower bound goes from negative 1 to positive 4. Okay? And then our new upper bound, we start at negative 3, we push it through our conversion, 1 plus 9 is 10. So our new upper bound is 10. Now, there's a, uh, now there is a match uh, in terms of the variable. Everything we see in terms of u, our bounds are also in terms of u. So now we can go through our application. G double prime, antiderivative pushes up, up a level to G prime. And once we're at the G prime level, we can plug in our upper and lower bounds. So G prime of 10 minus G prime of 4 with a negative 1 third down in front. And now we have, you can use our table uh, to help us, we can use our table to help us find those values. So G prime of 10 is 0. G prime of 4 is 5. So we have 0 minus 5 with a negative one-third out in front, negative one-third times negative five is going to be five-thirds. All right, part D, evaluate uh, the limit. Uh, so the first thing we do with limits is we just plug in that x value, right? Uh, this is a mess, but we want to, you know, if we plug in and, and if we evaluate the limit at that x value, if we get a real number, then there's nothing more to do. But let's see what we get first, right? So we plug one in. All right, so here's my expression. I'm going to evaluate the limit. I'm going to evaluate the limit at 1. So plug 1 in for all the x's that I see. So I get 9 minus g prime of 1. Got g prime of 4 minus 5. So g prime of 1, we look at our values here. g prime of 1 is 9. And then g prime of 4 is going to be 5. So we get 9 minus 9, which is 0. E raised to 0, which is 1. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times 4 is 8. G prime, G double prime of 4 is um, going to be uh, 2. Uh, sorry, G, um, G prime, sorry, I skipped a step here. Uh, G prime of 4 is going to be 5. 5 minus 5 is 0. So uh, we get um, uh, 2 minus 2, which is 0. 0 over 0. So that indicates to us that uh, the limit does exist, we just haven't found the answer yet. So the way we, this is not something that we can factor, we're gonna have to go through L'Hopital's rule. So L'Hopital's rule says, if we get zero over zero, we can continue working the expression by finding the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately. This will give us a different form for us to evaluate our limit. So we're gonna do that, okay. Now we only do L'Hopital's rule if you get zero over zero. So we don't want to just jump into L'Hopital's rule with, without first confirming that we are at a point that, um, that allows us to use L'Hopital's rule. So we need to find the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately. So e to the u, the rule for e to the u is e to the u times u prime. So we get 2e to the u times u prime, the exponent's derivative, 9 goes away to 0, but g prime becomes g double prime. Okay. Negative 2, it's a constant, goes away to 0, so we took care of the numerator's derivative. Now we're going to take care of the denominator portion's derivative. So g prime of 4x. Now this is really a chain rule that we have to um, be aware to apply because there's an outside portion and there's an inside portion. The outside portion of g prime will turn itself into g double prime, and the inside portion, the 4x, will turn itself into 4. Now, we don't put the 4 inside the parentheses because as we take the outside function's derivative, we leave the inside portion unchanged. So this chain rule says we'll turn it into g double prime of 4x times 4, and the 5 will go away to 0. Now that we have our derivative version for us to evaluate, we're going to reevaluate, plug 1 in to the remaining x's, we get g prime of 1, g double prime of 1 here. We get g double prime of 4 times 4. So uh, g prime of 1 is 9, so 9 minus 9 is 0. 2 times 
e to the 0, that's 1. 2 times 1 times g double prime is 4, so 2 times 4 is 8. And then g double prime of 4, uh, that is going to be 2. Looking at our table of values here, g double prime of 4 is 2. So we get 2 times 4, which is 8. 8 over 8 is equal to 1, so that's our limit. Okay. For part E, we have our function w of x defined as 3x squared times g prime of 2x. So now uh, uh, we have to recognize that this is uh, something that we have to apply using product rule and also a little bit of chain rule. After we find the derivative and spell out the derivative, we can then evaluate the derivative at 2. So I'm going to identify the product rule portions that we need to identify here. We got the f function, we got the g function, 3x squared, and g prime of 2x. So product rule, f prime g plus f g prime. 3x squared becomes 6x. We keep the g function intact. Back to the f function, keep that the same. And now there's a chain rule going on here. So g prime of 2x becomes g double prime of 2x times 2. Okay, there's a chain rule here. The outside portion is the g prime of parentheses. The inside portion is going to be uh, that 2x. So the chain rule here You got the outside portion, and you got the inside portion, which is the 2x. So we take turns with each of these derivatives. g prime becomes g double prime, keep the inside uh, unchanged, and then we take the inside's derivative, 2x becomes 2. So now, once we have our derivative spelled out, we can now evaluate the derivative at 2. So replace every x we see with 2. 6 times 2, g prime of 2 times 2, which is 4, 3 times 2 squared, g double prime of 4 times 2. And now we're going to try to convert these to be in terms of um, values that we can combine, get some of these out of function notation. So that's 12. g prime of 4, we can look at our table. g prime of 4 is going to be 5. 3 times 4, g double prime of 4, g double prime of 4 is going to be 2. All right. So now we just have to multiply these and combine these values together. We get 12 times 5, which is 60. 12 times 4 is 48. 60 plus 48 is 108. All right, part F, last one here. We have a differential equation. Y prime equals 1 minus 2Y, G double prime. Um, we want to find uh, an expression for K and then use it to find K of 3. So we have to go through separation of variables here. Y prime, another way to rewrite Y prime is dy over dx. So I'm going to get this fraction out of the way here. I'm going to multiply uh, dx to the other side. Doesn't quite get us full separation, but at least everything is sitting up in the numerator. And the only thing I need to do is decide what needs to divide over. Okay, 1 minus 2y, g double prime of x dx. Now these are in terms of x, so we'll leave this on the right side. The only thing out of place is this 1 minus 2y needs to be on the left side with the dy. So we divide this over. Now we have full separation. Dependent variable y is on the left. Independent variable on the right. Okay. We set up our indefinite integral. So this side requires a bit more work. We got to go through u substitution. We'll let the u value be the entire denominator. u equals 1 minus 2y. du over dy equals negative 2. dy equals du over negative 2. We make our substitution, denominator gets replaced with u, dy, I push it out as du over negative 2, and now we can recognize this as natural log. Okay. All right, so I have everything set up now. I'm going to apply the antiderivative rule, natural log on this side, g double prime here becomes g prime. All right, so we have natural log of u, absolute value of u with a negative one half coefficient tagging along. G double prime becomes G prime. This is indefinite integral, so the plus C will show up. Replace the U back in terms of uh, the original variable, in this case, Y. So now I want to try to solve for C. I have my order pair, 1, 0, which is provided for us. So 1 plugs in for X, 0 plugs in for Y. One, a natural log of 1 minus 0, that natural log of 1 is 0. All this will go to 0. 
g double prime of 1, we go to our table, g double prime of 1 is going to be 4. So now we have 4 plus c equals 0, solve for c, c equals negative 4. Okay, so now I'm going to update my equation now that I have my c value found. I'm going to replace c with negative 4. And now I'm just going to try to, it's not asking for us to solve for y. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, plug in x, uh, 3 in for x because I'm trying to find k of 3 and if I plug in sooner then I can get it down to a numeric answer a little faster. So I'll plug 3 in for x. Okay. g double prime of 3, look at our table of values, that's equal to 1. Uh, and now we can solve for y. Uh, this becomes negative 3, we can multiply both sides by negative 2, and now we can raise both sides, base e, clean up, 1 minus 2y equals e to the 6, and now we can try to get y by itself. So once we get y by itself, everything on the right, uh, everything on the, on the other side is, is just in terms of a numeric value, so that's k of 3. k of 3, we, over, we already plugged in 3 at this uh, juncture here, so k of 3 is just um, one half parentheses one minus e to the sixth, or we can write it as one minus e to the sixth all over two.